All right, uh, welcome everyone to this week of Autonomy Talks. This week is a great pleasure to have uh, with us Mark Muller. Uh, something about Mark. Mark is an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at UC Berkeley. So regarding studies, he completed his bachelor's in mechanical engineering from the University of Pretoria in South Africa. And he then moved uh, to Zurich, actually, where he obtained his master's and PhD uh, working with Professor Raffaello D'Andrea here in the very same institute as we are. Uh, after spending some time at Verity, where he worked on entertainment drones, which were installed uh, uh, among other places in New York, uh, Broadway. He moved to California where he, he joined uh, uh, UC Berkeley. His research focuses on the design of con and control of our aerial robots. And today is gonna give us some insights about this, uh, this topic. And hopefully we will see cool videos and very cool, cool acrobatics going around. So I'm very happy and, and, and excited to hear what you're going to talk about. And uh, I give you the stage, Mark. Thank you, Jaylee. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's, it's really nice to, to be uh, back at Zurich. Um, I was just saying, you know, I, I really look forward to, to being able to come over Christmas. Uh, my mother-in-law lives in Zurich. Uh, so the, the hope was to be there in person, potentially even for this talk. But of course, uh, now as all our plans have been put on hold, uh, we have to do everything virtually. So it's very nice to be back. Um, you know, uh, and I think uh, hopefully it's, it's interesting and there will be lots of videos. So hopefully Jaylee, you're, you're not disappointed. Um, you know, so here in the Bay Area and I think in Zurich and elsewhere, there's a lot of hype about autonomous cars. And certainly it's been very interesting to see the, the advances we've made in, in terms of being able to make these systems safe and reliable uh, and carrying people through through the city. And of course, they, they have this promise that they allow us to, you know, take this time that we spend commuting and do something more useful and more interesting, et cetera, with that time. And of course, we also have, um, you know, drones. And we know that drones have, have made huge steps and the autonomy of drones is also incredibly uh, impressive, right? So, you know, whether it's the sort of consumer level, um, I'm gonna take some photos kind of drones or agriculture package delivery or the entertainment kind of things that, that you know, Verity does. Uh, we've seen these things sort of become part of our everyday lives. And of course, now we are starting to see these two things converging uh, where you have the idea of, of carrying passengers or moving passengers and uh, drones connected to give you this sort of urban air mobility or advanced aerial mobility, depending on which acronyms you'd like or air taxis. Um, coming up as as potential um, you know potential ways that that these technologies can evolve, and you know I, I take this as sort of an inspiration because when you're trying to create systems like this, there are lots of really interesting challenges um, to solve. So uh, aerial robots are are interesting because anything that flies basically has some really hard trade offs and constraints that you need to balance. Um, and this is especially true when we're thinking of sort of these electric VTOL uh, things. So I just want to talk a little bit about how I think about design for these things and how we uh, in our group like to try and couple mechanical design with uh, dynamic analysis with controls design. So when you think of these, you know, um, aerial taxis, flying taxis, flying cars, uh, et cetera, there's a couple of, of challenges and sort of simultaneous objectives that are in conflict with one another. Uh, so first of all, you know, the power consumption is always going to be a main concern when you're flying uh, anything. So when I have a drone flying over a city, say uh, I want it to be low mass so that it's safe, right? So this thing has to, you know, if it's going to crash potentially, I need that to have as little impact on the world as possible. Um, it has to be compact, so small, so physically small. So, you know, I want it to be able to fit into our existing infrastructure to land in, say, two parking bays, something like that. Uh, I need it to have a long range. So I want to fly to my meeting. So, you know, I need to be able to cover range. And these things are, are in, contra, uh, in, in, in conflict with one another. I also need, you know, it to be agile so that I can you know, maneuver through tight spaces and avoid obstacles and collisions with... Uh, say uncooperative uh, people that share the airspace with me, like birds. Um, I need to be able to be comfortable. So if I'm going to fly passengers around, you know, most people are not going to be excited about the technicalities. They just want a boring ride from here to there. Uh, so it needs to be comfortable. 
And of course, you know, it needs to be quiet. And honestly, this quiet is something I am not working on, but this is probably one of the biggest challenges for these kinds of ideas is how do I make something that's going to be politically acceptable? Um, because you imagine if your neighbor has a, you know, takes off every morning in a craft that's 100 decibels to fly to the office, you will very quickly have a petition to ban them. Uh, they need to be autonomous. That's kind of obvious with flying things. You don't want to carry a pilot because a pilot is a passenger that you need to pay, uh, right? So that doesn't help you at all. And of course, they need to be safe, right? So this, you know, can't risk uh, crashes. So I want to talk about a few um, of the projects we're working on that vaguely fit into this, this problem setup. Uh, first of all, just how do we deal with disturbances in vehicles? And, you know, when we think of disturbances, you know, I have this, this video here. You can think of wind disturbances, uh, other disturbances, hail, things like this that sort of push your, your system around and away from where you want it to be. And these can either be just discomfort or they can be safety issues, right? So it can either just be something that makes the flight feel unsafe or actually be unsafe. And how do we get uh, systems that are capable of fighting this? So I think, I assume this is, uh, well, I don't know. Let's let's go over how does an aerial robot work? These drones, typically, they have a bunch of propellers that are aligned with one another, pointing in the same direction. And if you apply, you know, so some of the propellers rotate in one direction, some rotate in the other direction. The idea being, as the propeller rotates, it generates lift or thrust in the upwards direction, and it uh, counter torque. Uh, around the propeller uh, axis. And because they rotate in opposite directions, the thrusts can all sum to uh, produce zero torque. And if you write down Newton's law, you have that the acceleration, or rather the mass times acceleration, is equal to these uh, motor forces that all point in the common z direction of the body, so the body's upward direction, which is then rotated into the inertial with the rotation matrix. And then, of course, there's the weight. This model neglects other forces like uh, you know, drag forces, et cetera which happen when you're flying at higher speeds, but it's just sort of a, a simple model to get started and to understand the idea that I'm going to present. The rotation matrix, so this thing that tells me how the body is oriented with respect to the uh, world frame, evolves with this differential equation, where PQ and R are the roll rate, pitch rate, and yaw rate, so the co three components of angular velocity in the body fixed frame. All right, so this is typically the numbers that your rate gyro will measure. Uh, and then the angular velocity evolves according to Euler's law, which is the much messier cousin of Newton. Uh, and we have here on the left-hand side, the rate of change of angular momentum as expressed in the body fixed frame. And then you have on the right-hand side, a bit of a mess. So there's the second order term, which has to do with the fact that we're taking derivatives in a non-inertial frame, where this S operator is just the skew symmetric matrix version of the vector or the cross product. So you have here the cross product of the angular velocity with the um, uh, uh, momentum of the vehicle. So that's just the taking the derivative in a non-inertial frame. Then we have here the torque produced by the motor forces acting at a distance from the center of mass. Then we have the aerodynamic reaction torque of the propellers, this term here. And then we have the disturbance torques. And I'm modeling explicitly the disturbance torques because my uh, claim is that this is the one that we really care about. And we care about this because you can imagine this vehicle as it is flying, what matters is where this thrust vector is pointing. So if there is a torque acting on the vehicle that pushes this thrust vector away from where I wanted it to point, that means that suddenly I will start accelerating in an undesired direction. Typically, these systems also have relatively low mass moments of inertia, so they have the small disturbances can cause large angular acceleration. Um, so this is what I just said. So we really care about this direction, right? So where is the thrust vector pointing uh, as we move around? Because that dominates the acceleration. And of course, the acceleration is the thing that determines whether I'm going to collide with an obstacle. And that's what, you know, at least in part, what I feel as a passenger is, is the acceleration of the vehicle. So what we're going to do in this first part uh, of my presentation is we're going to design a system that has a sort of stiffness along this thrust direction. And we're gonna have this stiffness by adding angular momentum. And the idea really here is how do I use, how do I cheat by modifying the physics of the system to make my problem easy to solve? So, you know, just as a, maybe something that's not totally obvious, you know, if I take a normal drone, there's a lot of rotating parts, right? So at minimum four propellers but there's zero net angular momentum. That's because some of them rotate upwards and some of them rotate downwards. So if you sum it all up, there's zero net angular momentum. 
But the question now is what happens if we have a vehicle that has sort of non-zero net angular momentum and how can we use that? And there's sort of a, a problem that we as engineers already rely on this idea and that's sort of dual spin spacecraft. So if you're designing a spacecraft, uh, there's obviously very important pointing direction for the antenna, right? So you want the antenna to beam the data back to earth. Um, so you need this axis to be very stable. And typically what we do is we have this dual spin concept where you have one part of the aircraft or the spacecraft rotating. Uh, and that gives you a large angular momentum vector along this pointing direction, which gives us this sort of stiffness component. So this stiffness, I keep being very vague about, if we add this to our model, so let's say I take a quadcopter drone and I attach to it a source of angular momentum. So here it is putting a flywheel at the bottom of the vehicle. This flywheel rotates at some speed, omega w, so the speed of the wheel, uh, with respect to the body. Uh, and this then modifies the physics by changing the Euler's law equation. And it changes it in two ways. So there's two additional terms that have appeared. The first term here captures that if I accelerate the wheel, so you can imagine if I speed up this, this uh, flywheel, the vehicle will react in the opposite direction, right? Because that's an internal torque. So if I accelerate the wheel, the vehicle will sort of accelerate in the opposite direction. So that's the first term here. The second term is the more interesting one, and that's this cross-coupling term. So we already had the cross-coupling from the vehicle's angular velocity to the vehicle's angular momentum. Now we have this additional cross-coupling. This additional cross-coupling um, is now first order in the vehicle's angular momentum and first order in the speed of the wheel. And the point, of course, is that now the speed of the wheel is going to be a large non-zero uh, number, so far away from zero, I guess. Um, so this term typically is a second order effect, right? So this is second order in the angular velocity of the vehicle and typically we ignore it because um, it's going to be negligible compared to say the torques that we can produce at most um, maneuvers that we execute with these robots. However, this term is now first order in the angular velocity of the vehicle because the angular velocity of the wheel can be such a large number. So this is now first order term that I get to play with in my design. And I get to change this first order quantity by speeding up or slowing down the wheel here, right? And this gives me the ability now um, to basically play with the physics through this first order coupling. There's also an additional input. So you can imagine as I speed up or slow down the, the wheel, this gives me a, a, a torque input on the body. So if I'm sort of pointing a camera, I have an additional input in addition to the four motor force. This additional input is not so interesting. It doesn't give us very much uh, useful. What really matters is this term here that gives me the cross coupling. So what does this cross coupling exactly achieve? So if I take um, a drone, like I showed you, and I look at the horizontal dynamics, so we're ignoring the vertical dynamics, and I just do it to first order. We have the horizontal position. So I state space vector. Let's just go through the state space vectors here. I have the horizontal position x, y, so that's the sort of horizontal x, y position. It's derivative, so the velocity in the inertial frame. We have the roll and pitch angles, so where the thrust vector is pointing, and then the roll and pitch uh, angular velocities. And these will be the states that I'm interested in my horizontal motion. And I have two inputs, and I'm going to treat these two inputs as the roll torque and the pitch torque, right? And of course, these are constructed by taking the differences between motor forces, but conceptually, it's much easier to just think of the two torques as the inputs. And then I have this uh, first order model of the system. And you know, it's very sparse. Uh, and what I want to highlight sort of is this blue term here, which is the term from my momentum wheel. So this is how I effectively can cheat with the physics um, to modify the dynamics of the system. And you can see that this term here is a ratio of mass moments of inertia. So the inertia of the wheel to the inertia of the system, right? So the wheel plus the, the drone multiplied by the speed of the wheel. So if I set the wheel to be zero speed, this term goes away. And as I sort of ramp up the speed of the wheel, this goes up uh, and higher. And you can probably immediately guess that this is, a, is adding a, a purely imaginary pair of eigenvalues to the open loop system. So before the system was just a set of integrators, from the input to the position. Now there's this purely imaginary eigenvalue that I get to dial in by changing the speed of the wheel. So why is this useful? So this is useful um, because uh, at least of the, the hypothesis is this gives me the stiffness around the thrust direction, much like a spinning top or, or balancing a, a, base, a basketball on your finger. This rotation gives you that, um, 
added stability. But you can make this precise by looking at the H2 cost of the system. And here the H2 cost is very briefly, this captures in this context, if there's a unit impulse disturbance on the system, how much energy does it cost me to recover from that unit impulse disturbance? It's very closely related to the LQR problem, um, but it's a nice way to sort of make uh, controllability arguments with respect to disturbances. So we consider two types of disturbances, either a pure torque disturbance, so sort of you imagine sort of a, a hailstone hitting the drone, or a pure force disturbance, imagine the wind pushing the drone uh, to the side. And then what we care about is the position of the, the drone and the inputs to the system, right? So these are, if you, if you like to think of LQR problem, you're weighting the states, the Q matrix with these, and the inputs, the R matrix are just these. And then you can look at how sensitive am I to torque disturbances and to force disturbances as a function of how the speed of the wheel uh, increases. And the lower sensitivity is, of course, a better uh, result because that means that you require less energy to recover from a disturbance. And energy, we mean here in the sort of H2 sense, right? So not strictly energy, but uh, you know, control effort in, in some more uh, quadratic integral sense. And what we see is as we increase the speed of the wheel, so as we move to the right hand side on this graph, the sensitivity to torque disturbances decreases monotonically. And this is exactly the stiffening effect that we talked about. The force disturbance sensitivity though initially decreases slightly or at least is very flat and then sort of starts to increase. And this kind of intuitively perhaps makes sense. So you can imagine if this vehicle has you know, a massive amount of momentum around the thrust and I push it to the side for it to come back, it needs to rotate first. So it needs to fight um, this uh, angular momentum before it can, can bring itself back. So this suggests that there's sort of the sweet spot where I spin the wheel with some speed, I get some uh, torque disturbance rejection capability without paying or potentially even a small decrease in force disturbance sensitivity. So this allows us now to go ahead and design the system. There's some subtleties in how you choose, for example, the size of the wheel, et cetera, but I just wanna show you what this looks like. And the key here is what I'm gonna show you here, these videos are only messing with the physics. We then apply the same control um, designed to the system, uh, whether it has the momentum wheel or not. So this here is a regular quadcopter. It has the momentum wheel attached, but it's not spinning. So this is just a regular quadcopter physics. And we see attached to the quadcopter, we have these two arms sticking out from the frame. And these two arms are basically just sticking out and we'll use them to impact the drone. So I'm going to drop a steel ball uh, vertically onto this arm and that gives a very repeatable torque impulse. So we see this here in this video. So the steel uh, ball falls down, it hits the drone, and then the drone has to try and recover. And we see here that this disturbance causes a very large uh, tracking error, right? And intuitively, this makes sense. The moment the drone is pitched down, there's no thrust to combat gravity, and we just fall effectively with lunge. Now I want to show you exactly the same uh, video on the left-hand side here, but on the right-hand side, I'm going to have this wheel rotating. So on the right-hand side, we're rotating this angular momentum wheel. Uh, we're running a very similar control structure. So the bottom plot will show us the four motor forces. So how much effort is the vehicle putting in to fight the disturbance? And we show this graph uh, to kind of highlight the fact that it's not that this controller on the right hand side is more aggressive or has better tuning or something. Uh, it's really because we messed with the physics. So I'm gonna play this and I'm gonna let this run a few times. Okay, so the steel ball comes down, it hits the, the drone. And with the angular momentum wheel spinning, you sort of have this sort of oscillation, right? Exactly what you would expect if you spun a top and sort of tapped it with your finger. Um, we notice that the motor forces saturate for this system, right? So we do hit the min and max. If I look here at the case where it failed, we also notice that the motor forces saturated pretty much immediately. So here the system, as quickly as it can, is trying to balance out this disturbance. Um, but it doesn't, it's not able to, right? And this really captures this idea that this cross coupling allows me to make the system stiffer and thus more stable uh, by just messing with the physics effectively, right? So uh, thinking of the physical design as part of this problem. Switching gears now a little bit, um, you know, I talked about the power consumption being one of the big problems with these systems. So how do I make something that's small, that's light, that's quiet, uh, and that's safe, and that has a good range, right? So these 
requirements appear to be uh, opposed to one another. So if I think about you know, the energy, typically we are storing it in a battery. Of course, if you're using gasoline or something, you typically have much higher specific energy. However, in today's you know, world, hopefully no one's building new gasoline powered things. Uh, so we're looking at specifically battery powered systems. So the battery feeds power to the electronic speed controller that then drives a brushless DC motor typically. This is then mechanically coupled to some propellers and the propellers then push the air around. I'm gonna focus on these last or this last sort of transformation here where I generate thrust through the propellers. The you know, power consumption of this first set of components is pretty well understood. And there's, you know, typically you select from a catalog where some clever people have already done a lot of optimization on these first few. So I'm interested in this last, but how do I make systems that consume less power to achieve a certain objective? So a very sort of rough and ready back of the envelope calculation uh, is the following. So the power that you require uh, for a propeller that's not translating, so it's a hovering vehicle, is related to the force that this propeller generates and the size of the propeller with this ratio here, right? So it's the force to the power one and a half divided by the radius of the propeller. And this comes from uh, momentum theory. So the assumptions you need to make to get this result are basically that the air is incompressible and inviscid, and we're treating the propeller as just a disc that adds energy to the system. So we're neglecting the rotational aspect. It's a big simplification, but it gives us a very simple relationship. And this relationship tends to hold um, more or less to first order, at least uh, as you're varying these parameters. So if you take this and you think about a vehicle that you're interested in flying, what I'm interested in is I want a small vehicle, right? I want it to be compact to fit into my cities. So the, the radius needs to be relatively small. And the force here is related to the weight of the vehicle. So I want a uh, light vehicle, which means you know I need to somehow trade off payload structure, powertrain, and storage, energy storage uh, to get this force to be low. Okay, so if I want to fly a long time, right, just the simplest calculation, I want to have something that can operate for a long time. What I need is I need the ratio between the energy that I can store and the power that I consume to be as large as possible. And you know the energy in the battery more or less is proportional to the mass of the battery, and the power that I consume is assuming you know the powertrain is in there, is proportional to this quantity here, right? So the force divided by the radius. And if I then take the force to be proportional to the weight, so the mass of the battery plus the mass of everything that's not battery, we get this relationship here. And why do I bring this up? Well, you could imagine that you know, if I want to fly longer, I should just add more energy storage. So I should add more battery to my system. And at first glance, that seems reasonable. That's what we do with our cars. If I want to drive farther, I just add more gas to my car. However, it turns out for these systems, that's not true. So this plot shows um, the flight time on the y-axis versus the total mass of the vehicle. And by total mass, I mean, you know, I take the vehicle with a certain fixed amount of structure and motors and uh, everything that's not battery, and I add battery to the vehicle. And of course, there's some point where I have zero battery, so I only have non-battery mass, and of course, then I can't fly at all. And then as I add battery, my flight time increases until it hits this maximum here, after which the flight time actually decreases. So adding more energy to the system actually makes it fly less long. This uh, optimum here is when the battery makes up two thirds of the whole vehicle, right? So this is a somewhat dubious design point uh, where most of your vehicle is effectively a battery. And of course, the, you know, if you made a vehicle like this, there's lots of challenges. How do you make the structure of the vehicle strong enough? Um, your drivetrain will be very overspecced, right? Because your vehicle is, is very massive compared to the payload that you're actually interested in carrying. And of course, it's just a very heavy system. So when you look at this, there's sort of this fundamental limit to how far you can fly a vehicle or how long you can fly a vehicle if you fix the size of the vehicle, so the radius of the propellers, and you fix the payload, right? So this uh, remainder mass of the system. So if I want to generate a design that allows me to operate, say, in crowded city, fly over a useful distance and be quiet, et cetera, it seems like this is kind of an impossible task. So one solution or one you know, approach to perhaps uh, getting around this is uh, what we call flying battery. So the idea here is basically in-air fueling of these systems. So if I can have my, my mission drone, right, and separately have a set of these flying batteries where these flying batteries can connect to my mission drone along its mission, uh, I can then have the flight time range, et cetera, effectively be unlimited 
while having a low mass for the system as it is flying, right? Because it's only carrying a relatively small amount of battery. If I now make such a system, so we will see an experiment here where this is our main drone. This main drone will stay flying throughout the experiment. And then we have two flying batteries that are gonna come and you know, just continuously recharge the system. There's some sort of somewhat uh, clever electronics here that just sort of trigger which battery is being consumed for the, the main vehicle. Um, we can now fly this vehicle for much longer than the theoretical maximum. So this experiment is gonna last about an hour. I won't show you the full hour as a video, but you'll see here that this main drone has taken off and now it's just going to do station keeping and it's going to continuously be resupplied by a set of drones bringing it new energy. And this allows the vehicle to um, fly much longer. I think we achieved two and a half times the fundamental limit um, during this experiment. Uh, in this particular design, the main vehicle has a battery as well, of course, it has a small battery. So once the flying battery has disconnected, now the vehicle is relying on its own battery source. Uh, but of course, eventually this gets uh, depleted and that's then what sets the upper limit for this particular experiment. We are working on a, an update to this where the vehicle can actually recharge and in principle then fly until the component fails or you know, Karan, who you see running around in the background gets bored of changing batteries. Um, but in this way, we are now able to do this, this much longer experiment than you could fly otherwise. So skipping over the rest of the video, which basically just continues in the same way, we were able to fly this vehicle for about an hour, which is more than twice the theoretical limit, given the size and mass properties of the vehicle. So even if I could carry all of the battery, etc., I could not fly uh, even half of this total time. And of course, the key, I think, point here is that this is still a low mass system. So it's quiet, it's um, safer, et cetera, uh, because it doesn't have this massive battery pack attached. This graph here just shows, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, on the x-axis, the experimental time. So, you know, the roughly one hour experiment, uh, the current as it's discharging the battery, and then the voltage with the red just being a filtered version of the raw measurements in blue. And you see here this very typical LiPo discharge curve as we are replacing the batteries, uh, we see it jumping. Here, occasionally there is a problem where, you know, this docking did uh, not dock cleanly. So we had to like take off and redock the vehicle. So that's what you're seeing with these yellow uh, spots here. Um, and then at the end, the vehicle's onboard battery drops to low and we land uh, after an hour. So that's one way you can uh, potentially fly these vehicles long. But there's another crazy idea, which I just want to quickly mention here. Uh, which is inspired by how we design rockets. So when we are designing a rocket, you have somewhat similar problem with mass and uh, energy required to uh, carry that mass. With rockets, of course, the, the mass that we're worried about is the structural mass for things that don't benefit us anymore, right? So the, the parts of the rocket that we're housing, the propellant that has already been consumed, I can get rid of that mass. And that allows me to stage my rocket design to get better performance. Here we're interested in staging the battery. And the idea here is that unlike a combustion fuel, electric power, at least in the form of battery power, the total mass remains unchanged as I deplete my energy source, right? So the problem is that, you know, even if I you know, have a lot of battery, the mass of the battery stays with me throughout the flight. So can I get rid of this? So of course, you know, here, this is a, mostly just a proof of concept. Uh, please don't go do this over the Lake of Zurich. Um, I'm sure you will get arrested. Don't come do this here either. You might not get arrested, but it'll still be very bad. Um, if I can stage my batteries, so effectively, if I can get rid of the empty parts as I'm flying, how does this affect my flight performance? And if you can stage your battery infinitely, this is basically a combustion engine, right? So combustion engine, you consume the energy and then you get rid of it. So you don't carry any sort of depleted storage. And it turns out that there's sort of this in interesting result that um, you have a finite flight time, even if you have an infinite number of stages, right? So it doesn't matter how much energy I can store in my system. I still have this finite flight time. I still have an upper limit on the achievable flight time uh, for a, uh, a hovering vehicle, right? And this is kind of unintuitive. You would imagine with gas powered, a hover capable vehicle, I can basically fly as long as I need to by just adding more gas. But even for that case, we have a fundamental limit on how long you can fly. Of course, for battery powered, you're never gonna have an infinite stage. You're maybe gonna have two or three stages. Um, and this graph shows how your flight time can improve as you have more stages. So the blue curve is uh, as you have more and more battery as part of your total mass. 
uh, what your flight time is. So the blue curve is just with a single battery. And of course, we have this optimum here at two thirds battery mass. And then as you have two stages, the orange or three stages, we see how you can get longer flight time because you lower your mass for those parts of the flight where you have depleted a part of your battery. And then you can sort of, you know, if you're curious, you can mess with how you apportion the, the sizes of the batteries. Either you do it equally or you can try to optimize for this, but I'm not going to go into that too much. But just to show you what this can actually do, if you have two stages, so if I can drop uh, half of my battery through the flight, you have a roughly 20% improvement in flight time. So this graph here shows on the, uh, you know, the, the x-axis against uh, a time. So this is a hovering experiment. So this is just a drone that's hovering. Um, and the curve shows either, and I think this label is wrong now that I look at it, uh, having just a single stage, so depleting the battery as a single unit or depleting the battery in two stages and then dropping the empty stage. And of course, what happens is when I drop the empty stage, my electric power decreases because the weight of the system decreases and that allows me then to fly for a longer time. Um, and because we are doing this, you can keep flying your system in a very sort of uninterrupted fashion. So where could this be useful? If you imagine again, sort of a taxi network over a city, you could imagine if I can get rid of my battery over sort of these centralized nodes, potentially, it will allow me to operate my system uh, quieter and safer and longer. Of course, I think it's unlikely that something like this really is that useful compared to the flying battery idea, because it's much you know, safer if I can have my battery have its own wings, et cetera. Um, We've also done a little bit of work. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll skip this in, in the interest of time. Just to sort of briefly mention, you know, because we're trying to fly longer, there's also a question, how do I fly to optimize my energy usage? Uh, so if I'm trying to deliver packages, for example, like I'm doing some sort of package delivery drone, um, the packages I carry will all be different, right? So sometimes it might be a big box, sometimes it might be a football, sometimes it might be heavy, sometimes it might be light, uh, et cetera. And all of these things will affect the aerodynamics. So the question we asked ourselves is, can I figure out how to fly a given trajectory as efficiently as possible um, by varying both the speed with which I'm flying and the orientation of the vehicle? And so we imagine that I can rotate the vehicle around the thrust axis that doesn't change the translation, but it might change the drag characteristics. If I'm carrying a big flat box, of course, it's kind of intuitive. If I carry it uh, the broad way, I'm gonna have more drag than if I carry it the narrow way, except maybe it acts as a wing, right? So it's not totally obvious what the best thing is to do with something like this, right? So potentially the aerodynamics can actually be in your favor and give you uh, lift, which might decrease your power consumption. So what we did is we, uh, looked at this from the perspective of extreme seeking control. So we asked ourselves, can we design this extreme seeking controller to give us the optimal flight conditions, so speed and yaw angles um, along a given path to minimize either the power consumption, so to have a, as long a flight time as possible, or to minimize uh, or maximize the range, right? So if I, if I want to fly as far as possible, I want to minimize the energy used per unit distance or the ratio between power that I'm consuming and speed with which I'm moving. And the nice thing about this extreme seeking control idea is it requires no model of the power consumption. And the point is anyone that's, that's sort of looked at the power consumption of these systems, it's really hard to predict. And it's because there's a lot of interaction between the electric subsystems and the aerodynamics. And then the aerodynamics of course themselves are just hard to analyze and predict because there's a lot of complexity, especially when you start thinking about the drag and lift properties of strange bodies like you're seeing here. Extreme seeking control allows us to adapt to these things in a, in a model free way. Um, and maybe I skip over this and just mention that it allows us to then sort of operate this thing uh, and adapt. And what we have found, so sorry, I'm, I'm going too fast over this for it to be, I think, really interesting. Effectively, the vehicle oscillates its speed and your angle, and it then sort of moves in the direction of reducing gradient. And we found sort of you can improve your power consumption of on the order of 10%. Now I put an asterisk here because this 10%, um, we've tried to make this a fair comparison. Of course, if I start at a particularly bad set point, I can make this number as large as I want. So this 8% is if I start at the optimum for one configuration and I let the system adapt, given that I've changed the payload slightly, um, then I can get sort of these improvements. Uh, 
So this gives me sort of a 10% improvement in energy consumption. However, because the ESC has this sort of modifies the flight slightly by adding these perturbations, it does increase the cost as well. So there's an interesting higher level trade-off here between how much adaptation do I want to do, um, given that the cost of this adaptation is not negligible. And this is, is particularly interesting because you can imagine as you're flying your mission, the weather might change. So there might be a headwind that starts coming in, which might modify where the optimum is. Um, or you know, the, the vehicle might heat up. This might change some of the energy uh, um, consumption characteristics. So it's not obvious that you just want to uh, you know, adapt for the first minute and then stick to it for the rest of the flight. So there's sort of this question of how much adaptation do you really want to do? OK, now I want to go away slightly from the, the air taxi. Uh, and go more into sort of speculative design questions. Um, and this project is, is one of the favorite ones in my group for me. Uh, and it, was, it comes from a discussion I had with a biologist and they were sort of talking about how the birds that they study have these incredible capabilities that our robots don't have. And I was slightly offended because, you know, their birds basically just don't die, right? That's, that's the mission of a bird and they're very good at not dying, but our robots can do much more than that. Um, but he pointed at sort of some of the agility that birds have, uh, and specifically something like this. So we see here, this is a goshawk um, that's flying through a very narrow gap, and it, it can do this by modifying the shape of the bird, right? So changing its shape. Um, another view of this is sort of from the front. So you see this incredible ability of the bird to change its shape in response to the environment to fit through narrow spaces. Um, and of course, what's notable about most robotic systems, aerial robots especially, is that they have very little internal degrees of freedom. So they tend to be very rigid objects. The reason that we like rigid objects as roboticists is that they're easy to model, right? And especially in aeronautics, easy to model means I can sort of do things like promise safety, et cetera. In our case, you know, we, we asked ourselves, how can I take a, an aerial robot and give it similar properties? How can I take an aerial robot and make it uh, flexible, give it internal degrees of freedom, and then use those to achieve similar uh, tasks. So use my shape-shifting ability now to fly, for example, through a narrow gap. Uh, and the, the first idea we had was just add some springs to the arm of the vehicle. So imagine if the vehicle has a thruster, this thruster is attached to the central body with a rigid connection. If I take this rigid connection and I replace it with a flexible connection, which is sprung, so at, uh, if there is no thrust, then the spring pulls the arm down. Uh, I can now change the shape of the vehicle and sort of do something very similar to what the goshawk is able to do. So when you now take this, this idea and you sort of push it, you discover that there's a lot of complexity uh, and trade-off. So you have a propeller attached to the main body with some hinge. You have the location of the center of mass of the body. Uh, and then you need to attach the spring somewhere to the arms and somewhere to the body. And you need to then trade off how quickly you want the arm to be able to fold versus how much force you need to unfold the arm and to keep it up. And there's a lot of sort of interesting trade-offs. There's sort of some optimizations you can do for how you lay these things out. Um, the end result is that you have to fly as a quadcopter. You need to produce a minimum amount of force on your propellers to prevent the arm from folding down uh, when you don't want it to fold down. And this takes the shape of some additional constraints. So this uh, is sort of a somewhat ugly equation, but it's basically a set of uh, box constraints on my quadcopter input, which I need to satisfy to keep the vehicle in the quadcopter configuration. And as I make the springs stiffer, of course, the vehicle can change shape more quickly, but these constraints become more and more restrictive, uh, and the vehicle thus becomes less agile in its normal quadcopter mode. Um, skipping over all of the details of the design, what does this look like in the end? So this is our quadcopter. So we have our hinges that connect the arms to the body. We have some linear, uh, sorry, some uh, constant force springs that connect the arms to the body. And this allows then the vehicle sort of to fold into this very compact shape. And then if you produce thrust on the arms, you can imagine that this uh, overcomes the force from the spring and causes the arms to unfold until the arms hit the mechanical stop at the top, which then locks them effectively in this upright configuration until the thrust force is low enough for it to fold again. And what we can now do is we can now fly the vehicle through narrow gaps. So what you're gonna see on this video uh, is this drone here, take off, fly through this gap, 
uh, which is smaller than the vehicle could fit through. Um, it's going to do this by changing its shape. So here we just see a, a side view of this, um, and we see it's very similar to sort of how the goshawk uh, did its flight. So it, it goes from normal flight to this ballistic uh, falling mode, and then unfolds back into normal flight. So to emphasize here, I think it's visible, and I think everyone at ETH knows uh, about these things, but this is all done under mocap, right? So here we have the mocap doing both the measurement of the obstacle and the measurement of the vehicle. So we're totally cheating for state estimation. This is all about the design and the control of the system. Uh, but we see the vehicle is capable of doing this here, just sort of a gratuitous shot from the front. So we see here when the vehicle flies through, um, it's smaller than uh, the hole, but if it does not fold itself, there's no way it can fit through. And this gives us basically um, an additional capability that a normal drone would not have. Just very quickly, we've updated this design. It's still under review, so I don't want to talk too much about it. But if you're interested, uh, you can find the paper on our website. This is a new version of this vehicle that's capable of hovering in a narrower mode as well. So here we see the vehicle flying with two propellers only. Uh, and it can then also fit through not just a gap of that size, but actually a tunnel, because it can sustain its weight as well. Um, so this is a uh, much nicer design. It's much more elegant. It has no springs, so the constraints are much smaller, et cetera. Um, and this almost is. Uh, you know, if you take a quadcopter, build it like this, not like a quadcopter, because you effectively get a lot of behaviors almost for free. There's li very little additional downside to building a vehicle like this rather than a standard quadcopter. Um, I want to leave some time for questions. So I'm going to jump over this and I want to talk about just very briefly some work we've been doing on collision avoidance. Uh, so, of course, you know, as I'm flying my aerial taxi through the world, I want to make sure that I don't collide with anything. If I'm flying a robot, uh, trying to explore an environment, I have a very similar problem. The typical robotics approach, the classic, uh, I say this, it's not pejorative, this is typically how we do things, is we have a state estimator that informs a controller that sends commands to the vehicle. The controller is trying to track some reference trajectory that comes from some global planner, and the global planner uh, plans in some map, which is generated uh, from sensor data. And this is typically a very slow loop. It's expensive to generate the map. It's expensive to do the global planning. So this runs at a relatively low rate compared to the inner faster loop. Uh, and much like we like to separate the state estimator from the controller, so you do a, a common filter and an LQR controller perhaps for these two, you similarly separate the mapping and the planning. What's nice about this approach is, of course, it makes it easy for us to think about optimality, right? So LQG, for example, is very straightforward. But the downside is it tends to be fragile. So if there are problems, uh, you can think of you know, bad loop closure, et cetera. This will give you very bad results here. So one of the things we're interested in is, how can I overcome this? How can I make myself less sensitive? And specifically, um, the idea is if I have a local planner, so not just a, a feedback controller, but a local planner, which does some sort of um, motion plan in my local environment uh, with a sensor that gives me sort of real time information. Uh, and I can keep this at the fast loop, then I should have a much safer system. Because if the mapping or planning fails, I still have a local plan which is um, reasonable. Okay, so how do I avoid collisions? So there's two problems we're interested in. One is if I have a dynamic environment. I'm going to show you here just sort of a vehicle that's going to try and avoid an obstacle that it doesn't know about before it crosses its path. This is still using the offline uh, sensing, or the off-board sensing, rather. Um, and what I want to show you here is the approach that we use is, you know, if I have a fast way of generating trajectories, I can do the sampling-based planning. So what you see here is the vehicle can generate many different ways of potentially avoiding the obstacle. And then we have ways of very quickly testing whether you do, in fact, safely continue your flight or not. And then you execute that motion, which is the most safe. In this environment, we're using the offboard sensing and offboard computation, but we're also interested in doing this on the vehicle. So here, um, what we were doing on the vehicle is we were combining a depth camera. Uh, so this gives us sort of a local map effectively at every sensor measurement. And then we plan a motion in this local map uh, at every time instant that we get a new depth line. And the idea is that this local map, this depth image, um, is memoryless. So I only use the current image, I plan in it, and I execute a little bit of that plan in an MPC fashion. And at the next time instant, I throw away the previous image and just start with a new image. So any noise that was in that previous image, any sort of sensor error, 
is only going to be valid for a very short time. And hopefully at the next cycle, I can replan. Um, and this gives us robustness to sensor error, but also potentially robustness to dynamic obstacles, things like this. As long as they move, and this is a big caveat, as long as the dynamic obstacles move slowly compared to the vehicle, right? So at this point, we're not segmenting the environment and trying to detect the dynamic obstacles, but as long as the environment changes slowly, we should be able to respond to that. And the idea is, you know, my depth camera gives me this picture of the world. Um, it is necessarily a bunch of pixels on a rectangular grid. So I can generate, and without going into too much detail, I can generate pyramids in this image. So a pyramid with the apex at my camera position, and then with a flat surface that's perpendicular uh, to the field of view. Um, and if I decompose the world into these pyramids, we have tools that can very quickly tell us whether um, our trajectory stays safely inside a pyramid or not. And if I then use these tools, I can very quickly test for collisions of my vehicle with the environment. Uh, and we do this in a sampling-based approach. So, so this nice anytime algorithm uh, property where you know, the more compute I have, just the richer my sampling, the more I will sample and the potentially better the resulting trajectory will be. So just to show you some experimental videos um, before I end, uh, this is a quadcopter that weighs about a kilogram. We use an Intel tracking camera for state estimation. We use an Intel depth camera that generates this local map. Uh, there's a PX4 flight controller that basically runs a very low level controller. And then we have an Odroid, which is going to be running all of the priming. So everything is happening on board this Odroid. And what we're doing is as we're flying, we are then taking the depth image, decomposing it into these pyramids and then planning in the pyramids to test for collisions. So this is a simulation just to give you some sort of picture uh, that you can see what this might look like. This is the onboard view and on the right hand side, you can sort of see the external view. And as we're flying, the vehicle takes each image, decomposes it into the pyramids uh, and plans in those. This is happening at about 30 Hertz. So we get the camera measurements at 30 Hertz. And then you know, in each of those 33 milliseconds, we execute the full planning loop, evaluate thousands of candidates um, and keep the one which is lowest cost and collision free. Each of these candidates that we plan is um, ending at rest safely in my current depth image. So if, say, my sensor were to fail or something, I should be able to just execute my last trajectory and it should end safely at rest in the environment. So this has this sort of recursive safety property as well. Um, whenever, say, there's no more trajectory left that I can execute, right, I can't find a new plan, all I do is I just execute the last trajectory until rest, and then I have sort of guaranteed safety uh, in that sense. And of course, you can use this now to fly. This is a flight through an orchard where we're interested in gathering data um, on a uh, agricultural environment. So we see here the drone uh, flying through this environment. We have no knowledge about the environment before we start flying. And of course, you can imagine something like this natural environment is tricky to operate in um, because it's very unstructured, right? And there's lots of thin obstacles, et cetera, that only appear in your field of vision as you get closer to them. Um, Right, so this is uh, really focus on fast computation and using that for robustness. Just to show you what it looks like from the vehicle's perspective, this is the local map in which we plan. So this is the sort of noisy uh, depth image that we can now use to, to do our motion planning and, uh, as we're flying. Okay, and with that, I am slightly over time. Uh, so I just wanna acknowledge that, of course, you know, professors, we get to, present all the cool videos and you know, give the talks in front of interesting people like you. But of course, all the hard work is done by um, the students, right? So here, I'm very fortunate to have a fantastic team of students. Um, they work with me. Uh, Nathan Bucky, uh, who did some work on the, the planning that I just showed, he just graduated. So he's a doctor now, and I'm very proud. Uh, he's sort of the first uh, student to graduate from my group. But there's lots of uh, students, graduate and undergrad, um, that have you know, worked with us and have done a lot of really cool stuff. And of course, uh, lots of funding that I need to acknowledge as well that actually pays for us to do all of the fun things we do. Um, all of our info is on our website. And if you have questions that you don't get to ask now, feel free to send an email. Uh, and then I, hopefully we have some time for questions, Jerry. Yes, thank you very much, Mark, for the great talk. Uh, you open the stage for questions. If you have one, just unmute yourself and simply ask. Hi, Mike. This is uh, Jacopo Dani from uh, Fratelli's lab. So uh, I like your first set of experiments with the spinning wheel and uh, that added stiffness now to the to the quadcopter when it was hit by the steel ball falling. 
the question is, have you considered uh, mounting those uh, discs on a gimbal? And so basically putting a control moment gyro on top of the drone and having a much you know, bigger uh, spectrum yeah. of control on the input? So that's a, I mean, it's a great question. And it's something we, we played around with um, a little bit. Let me just try. So the, you know, if, if I look at this, this vehicle here, uh, if I put, if I can actuate the wheel in, in yep. the rotated, I get effectively two relatively large, potentially torques that I can act on the body. The problem is that to do that, you typically need quite a beefy actuator on the, you know, to, to rotate this. So you need relatively large internal torques. Uh, which makes it heavy and compared to the torques that I can produce anyway, it's not that important. So it ends up, it, it doesn't really buy you that much compared to the relatively large roll and pitch torques that I can produce anyway. Now, of course, you could argue that, you know, it's on top of, you know, if, if I look at the motor saturation that I have, you know, it's clear that avoiding that saturation would still be useful. Um, but for us, it, it didn't seem like the trade-off was worth it. And perhaps we should revisit this at some point because it is, it is an interesting point. Thank you. All right, any other question? Ilya, you seem to have a question. Hi, Ilya, nice to see hey, you again. Hey, Mark. <laughs> yeah, I actually also had a question um, uh, about the last project that you presented with um, about onboard estimation for collision avoidance. Um, we actually also investigated something like this in our lab, and we found that reactive approaches are very sensitive to, to noise in your depth map. Have you done kind of like an investigation how, how um, sensitive your approaches when you have degraded performance of the depth camera because the data that we've shown looked very very clean right also the ones from from the orchard That's interesting so we you know in our experiments the the thing that seemed to limit us was the the estimated the tracking performance um, that seemed to be where we got you know broke down first is as we were flying the speed limit was really not determined by the, the depth with which we could sense or something. It was really where that, that tracking camera started to lose uh, state estimate. Um, okay. It's interesting, like for us, this is typical performance. So we did not have, like we, we've never looked at it because it didn't seem to be an issue, but it's something that I, I, I will make a point of looking into a little bit to see if, if we have some data that suggests this. But as far as we could in, in our experiments, that was not a big issue. Okay. Which yes. depth camera are you guys using out of curiosity? Yeah. And we're actually using the exact same sensor same setup. So we also use both these real sense cameras. Yeah. Because we've used it in, in both indoor environments and underground sort of dark environments, as well as here. This is just a you know, this was a, a bright, sunny California afternoon, right? So yeah. It's it's for us it worked well. Um, nice. Yeah. And I will say the newer Intel cameras seem to be better, the D455 compared to 35, but they're a bit heavier, right? So they, they mm -hmm. seem to have yes, better exactly. Nice, thank you. Thank you, Ilya. All right, any other yeah, questions? You should, you should send me your thesis when you graduate, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I will. I'm not sure where you are on that path, but I'm guessing it's not too far. I will. Any other question? Maybe I have one. Um, I really like the when you sh were showing the uh, fundamental trade-offs related to the mass, right? And and you, you cannot really avoid that trade-off. Uh, and the, I, I in the final part of the talk, you were showing also uh, the actual embodied intelligent case in which everything is on on board. Um, have you done some investigations regarding the trade-offs there, maybe with the computation or quality of, of images uh, or yeah, so perception system a, in general? It's an interesting question. Um, you know, if, if you look at a, if you think about a vehicle like this, the power to hover is, is on the order of 150 watts for a vehicle, about, you know, this is about a kilogram. So it, it kind of doesn't, you know, of course, you know, if, you know, it depends on how big your computer is, but the, the power you're using for the computer and the sensor generally is negligible compared to the flight power. Uh, now, clearly, you know, if I wanted to fly a, a Xavier on this, I can't, right? So the, that's too massive. But um, I think once you start scaling your vehicle up to anything that can carry a person, uh, the amount of power you need for the computer is, is negligible compared to the power you just need to fly. Right. So I, I think generally that's not a big issue. Of course, you know, the 
the sensor mass really does matter. So here, you know, we, we still use the 35 a lot instead of the 55 because it is just lighter and smaller, right? Um, so for these sort of smaller drones, there is a, a big trade-off that, that matters there. If you think about your tracking cameras, um, if I have more cameras, I have, you know, a better SLAM system, uh, I need a bigger computer, but I will get better performance as well. But at some point that does really eat into your, your margins from the mass perspective. From the pure power consumption, ignoring the mass, generally it's negligible just because you need so much just to fly. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, uh, it seems no other questions are there, but thank you very much for the talk. And I guess you gave your email so people can reach out in case you yeah, have deeper discussions to start to check i don't have the chat oh, no there's nothing in the chat okay i remember it was in the last uh, in the last slide you put your email um, yeah so if you have you know i'm always yeah exactly uh, if there are any questions or anything feel free to reach out um the website hopefully is up to date uh has all of the information so <laughs> thank you very much mark for the great talk uh wish you good luck for the next steps and also uh, wish you good holidays and Thank you. Likewise the next to everyone step. over there. Stay safe. Uh, happy, happy holidays. Merry Christmas. And you know, like you. here's to traveling more in the new year, hopefully, and uh, then maybe I can make it out to Zurich again. All right. Take care. Bye. See you all Bye. next week.